Hey everybody, welcome to FRM 120. We're back. Uh, we covered safety in our first lesson and now we're going to move into a little bit more of the technical end of it and we're going to start with electricity. And the reason that we're going to start with electricity is that is probably one of the most extensive uh, topics that we're going to cover in this class because uh, electricity is the primary uh, source of power and uh, the primary source of getting the work done in a brewery. And so we need a lot of time to cover this. But as I stated before, um, you're not going to be electrical engineers when you get out of this class. That's not my point. And also, I'm not going to teach you any more uh, than you need to know, okay? Uh, I'm not going to teach you formulas for the sake of, of working formulas. I don't believe in that. Uh, but I am going to teach you formulas, but there's going to be a reason behind it, and we're going to have an application for it, so you'll see how it all comes together. So I encourage you to take notes as we go through this video, because when we do have the labs, um, you're going to need to reference your uh, notes in order to be able to do the lab activities. So just a little uh, friendly reminder there, take notes, and if you have any questions about anything that we're covering in the class, please reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to talk over the phone. We can uh, do it over text if you like, or if you can find me in a lab uh, here on campus. Uh, by all means, just grab me and we'll sit down and we'll talk and kind of clear up anything that doesn't make sense to you. But we're going to go ahead and jump right into the, the electricity. I like to make this, uh, these videos kind of short um, or in, in chunks that we can digest. So I try to keep them somewhere between 20 minutes plus or minus five or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. It's easier for me to upload and edit, and it's also easier for you to kind of take it in small chunks. And also, if you have to relocate information that we talked about, you can kind of get an idea of which uh, segment of the videos uh, that that topic might be in, so it's easier for you as well. But we're going to continue to move forward, and I just uh, listed some things here that we're going to be covering. What is electricity, uh, voltage, current, and resistance? Ohm's Law and Power. Those are some of the things we're going to talk about uh, in this lesson. So I just happened to get on Google and I said, you know, what is electricity? And it's a really kind of a long definition, but it really hits it accurately. And I'm going to break this definition into two segments. But the uh, Google definition was a form of energy resulting from the existence of charged particles, such as electrons or protons, and we're going to go into those a little bit later. Um, either statically as an accumulation of charge, okay, sitting there doing nothing but it's ready, or dynamically, which is moving, uh, and that's in the form of a current. And we're going to get into terminology and all kinds of things. So, you know, just for those of you who have never dealt with electricity, we're taking it down to the very most, the, the most basic fundamental level we can. Uh, some of you have got experience with electricity, and so, you know, uh, there's probably going to be some things that you'll pick up on. But uh, for those that have experience, just kind of enjoy the ride, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to get more and more uh, advanced as we go. Uh, the other definition that Google had, which I thought was rather interesting, is a state of thrilling excitement, sort of like this class, okay? You can take that for what it's worth, all right? Uh, and the example they gave was, the atmosphere was charged with a dangerous sexual electricity. Well, we're just going to kind of stick with the first definition. Um, I think that's more appropriate. Uh, and more applicable to what we're talking about. So I broke this down into two sections here. Uh, the, uh, the first part of it is a form of energy resulting from the existence of charged particles such as electrons or protons. Now, what you see here is an atom, and you're thinking, oh, good night, why are we going into atoms, you know, the atomic level of this? I promise you there's a reason for this, okay? We're going to get into it. And we're not going to go deep into the theory, but it just gives you an idea of when we're talking about current flow, where does that come from? You know, I don't want to leave any questions uh, unanswered as far as the basics are concerned. But you have an atom here, and inside the nucleus or the center here, you have positive or neutral charged ions, okay? And on the outside, you have electrons, which are negatively charged particles, okay? And they are the, the electrons are the ones that are constantly rotating around the nucleus. They're in, they're in motion and they are traveling, they're known as valence uh, ions. And so, uh, again, protons are the positively charged particles, neutrons are the ne neutral or no charged particles, and electrons are the negatively charged particles. And like I said, electrons are the ones that do the traveling or the orbiting around the nucleus, okay? And these electrons form a shell, and we call those the valence shell, or valence shell, excuse me. And basically how this works is whenever there is a proton lost in the atom, 
an electron moves in, into the next one, it, moves, it takes its place, okay? So we have this motion here, and as the, as the uh, definition says, when one of the va um, valence atoms loses a proton, it attracts an electron in its place from the adjacent atom. So it's just kind of movement, and this movement of the valence electrons is what causes us to have electron flow or current. And current is, the definition of current is electron flow, okay? And uh, this is just a little bit bigger graphic here. And, and you see a proton leaves and an electron takes its place. And we have motion. We have movement here. And it kind of reminded me, this, this whole graphic here kind of reminded me of the uh, thing from Adam's family. Uh, so just kind of reaching back in the day. But I, thought, I saw that. I was like, yeah, it looks like Adam's family. So anyway, I'm going to include it. So anyway, so why are we even talking about electron flow? Why, why is it important? Atoms and things like that. Why is it important? Um, well, copper. Uh, we have copper atoms. Everything's made up of atoms. And so copper is made up of atoms that have, they're a material that easily allows the flow of electrons. This is why we have copper wire in our homes, in our cars, and things like that. It is the conductor or the wire of choice because, uh, for, for a couple of reasons, but um, well, copper is one that allows the, the electron flow to move very easily without very little resistance, okay? And that you're going to see a little bit later how that's important. I'll kind of bring these things together as we talk about them. They're, they're, you're going to think, well, they're kind of fragmented a little bit. They are. I'm putting these pieces of puzzle in place, and we're going to pull them all together. But we're looking at something that la allows us to have good, easy, smooth, uninhibited flow of electrons so that we can have current moving through our wires. And copper is one of those conducting materials that does that for us. Okay? Uh, and here's just another graphic where the electrons are flowing through here. And like the, the uh, slide says, Copper is an elect, elect, excellent conductor of electricity. Okay. Now, I like to use analogies when I'm teaching, uh, particularly with electricity, because electricity is something you can't see um, until it's too late. Uh, but uh, I like to use analogies, and, and for for those who have never been around it, and we I usually pull things in that uh, people can relate to, like things around their homes and stuff like that. And one of the things we're talking about current, and we're talking about um, we're talking about uh, atoms, you know, moving across a conductor. Well, it's a lot like water. Water is the current uh, it, uh, flow of water molecules uh, in a hose, okay, or a pipe, or, some, or or even in a river, okay. You go across the um, the Ohio River and you see it kind of white cap in one day. It's moving rather quickly, as opposed to a day where it's real smooth. And you're, and the difference there is. The current is moving faster on those white capping days as it moves along, usually with some wind pushing it along. Uh, and also, uh, if it's moving around slow, then we say, well, the current's down or the current is up, whichever the case may be. But we're referencing how quickly those water molecules are traveling through the, uh, the river there. Okay, same thing with the hose, too. You know, if you have water just kind of dribbling out or at a full force. So I like to use analogies, and again, electricity is the current. Um, current is the flow of electrons going through the wire as opposed to a hose. So again, I'm going to use analogies to help you kind of bring it all together. But the three things that we need in order to complete a circuit, and we have to have circuits uh, for things to operate. You don't just have electricity out there. They've got to have a path that they've got to go through. And there are a couple of things that they've got to have in order to make that circuit complete. Okay? Number one is a power source. And the other is a conductor uh, or conductors. Which is, which is wiring, okay? And we also have to load. Now let's break all these three down here and give you some examples, okay? First of all, we're gonna talk about power source, okay? Now this happens to be the symbol for a battery or a DC power supply, and so we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, power sources come particularly with DC um, or direct current, okay? Um, you'll see why, why we call it direct current in the next couple of slides, but DC, direct current, usually comes from batteries, which uh, use chemical reactions uh, in order to create that, uh, the uh, flow of electrons through our conductor. Okay? And as most of you know, well, I'm sure all of you know, uh, batteries um, have, an, have a finite life to them, okay? and they can get rather expensive to replace, uh, but uh, they're not really practical and they're not very sustainable in terms of uh, the things that we need in power in the breweries and things like that. Like, 
we don't power our elements for heating with DC. We don't uh, really use DC for controls. Uh, well, we do, but, but not as a primary control. Um, but, but they are used extensively in the automotive industry. Uh, you know, you, go, you open your car and you've got your battery in there. Well, that's DC, that's direct current, as opposed to alternating current, which we'll deal with in just a minute. But it's used extensively because it's portable. You know, it rides around in your car. You don't have to have a cable hooked to it. Uh, from the house or anything like that. So batteries uh, are a DC power source, but they are not that good for what we need them for, okay? Uh, when we do need DC power in our control panels, in the, in the uh, brew house control panels where we hit the temperature buttons and we turn the elements on and things like that, um, sometimes the control voltages that control the bigger power um, is used, uh, we use DC. It does have its advantages and it has its place in the breweries in our control panels mostly. But it converts the AC voltage, like the, the voltage coming out of the plugs at your house, it, co it converts that AC voltage into DC, okay, direct current. And this is something, you, know, you don't have to replace this, it doesn't die, it doesn't wear out, it will fail at some point. But um, it's what we consider a sustainable source of DC power. Uh, and it's used exclusively in control circuits. And I'm not going to show you how it's hooked up, but you, you, you do connect your uh, 120 volts down here, and out of the top we get... Uh, 24 volts in this particular case. 24 volts is a popular control voltage, but we get 24 volts coming out of there. So that's how we get our uh, DC power in our brew circuits, things like control circuits with brew house and things like that. However, oh, and one more thing. Um, <clears throat> this is the symbol. You might want to know this as we write our notes. This is the t symbol for DC power. Okay, you'll see this in schematics, which we will be getting into. So that's a good thing for you to kind of get a visual. Uh, mem memory of this and uh, jot it down, but we use mostly AC power, alternating current that comes from these power plants that you see going down the highway, okay, the big smokestacks and everything, and um, they use these large generators, and actually they are alternators, and we're going to learn what the difference between those is, and, uh, but they, they turn these massive, and we'll call them generators for right now, or alternators, they turn these massive uh, generators that create this uh, tremendous amount of uh, power that's gone, that goes out onto our uh, power grid. And they create alternating current as opposed to direct current. Uh, and this is the most common power source that you'll see, uh, in, particularly in breweries, okay? Now, um, most common power source uh, is used in heavy industry, commercial, and residential. What you have in your home is AC, alternating current. You have a couple of different voltages, and so we'll get into voltages too. But you got a couple of different uh, voltages in your house, but they power the, the, the dryer, they power your hair dryer, they power your microwave oven, your TV, and computer, all those things like that. And this is the symbol for AC or alternating current. Now, it may or may not have the circle outside, but it will have the little uh, sine wave right here. And the reason it's uh, to kind of relate the symbol to alternating current is if you can imagine a flat zero line right here, we are alternating to the positive side of that, of that line and then also down to the negative side. So alternating 60 times a second, okay? And that's what we call hertz. Uh, and I'm going to give you an assignment of where you can go and find a little bit more information on hertz there in your own homes. But it's alternating as opposed to this direct current line here, okay? So this is alternating current, and it may or may not have the circle uh, around it. So it, you know, that's, that's not a make or break or anything for that symbol. Okay? So the other thing, we've talked about power sources. The other thing, the second of the three things that we need is conductors. Okay? Now, the conductors are the wires uh, that are required to get a, a path of electrons throughout our circuit. In other, to make, in, or, in other words, in order to make things work, We've got to have a way to get that power to our devices. Okay, the devices could be heating elements in the hot liquor tank. It could be um, uh, motors to the chugger pumps and things like that. So um, th that's what we have as far as uh, we've got to provide power to those. And we do it via the conductors. Now, going back, the conductors to our analogy, um, the pipe or the hose, uh, or in some cases the river, but more contained in pipes or hoses, the water flow, okay, and, and of course with the, uh, the electric part of it, we use wires as our conductors, but it allows that current flow to get from point A to point B, all right? All right, and again, uh, it gives the electricity a path from the power source to any device we're trying to do to operate, and most of the time it's in copper, okay? 
Um, and uh, covered that there. And now copper is the most common because it has a very low resistance to current flow. I talked about that earlier. Now aluminum, you, you might run into aluminum, but, but I doubt you will because uh, even though it's a better conductivity to weight ratio than copper is, okay, there's just some of the advantages. Um, it's, it's used in the overhead power uh, grid, the, the transmission lines that you see when you're going down the highway and you see these big uh, towers with these three phases of voltage going down there. Those big wires going down there uh, are, are copper. And uh, they're about a sixth of the cost of uh, copper. So we, they use aluminum. Okay. Now, so why aren't we using aluminum more uh, than copper? If it's cheaper and it's lighter weight and all these advantages here like that, why are we not using that? Well, they've got some residential issues um, and some, and some uh, dissimilar metal issues as well. Uh, the, the, the similar metal, meaning there are two different types of metal, uh, was creating problems with, uh, loose, with bad connections. Um, the aluminum would heat up at a different rate than copper would, and it would get a loose connection. And when you have a loose connection, you have resistance, and, we, and we're going to talk about that too. And when you have resistance, you get heat. Heat causes fires and problems like that. So aluminum has its place, but it's not, aluminum conductors has its place, but it's not in residential or commercial uh, industries, mostly for power transmission. Uh, and there's also oxidation issues too. The, uh, the aluminum will oxidize. Uh, copper will too, but uh, it does so, it causes more resistance when it um, oxidizes with aluminum. Gold is a fantastic conductor. Uh, you're not going to use gold as a conductor anywhere in the uh, brewing system, but gold is used in printed circuit boards, in our computers, and our other smart devices and things like that because it's an outstanding, probably the best conductor, but it's obviously cost prohibitive. You don't make uh, wire out of gold because it just astronomically cost. Uh, so anyway, um, gold is uh, an outstanding uh, conductor. Now, the third part that we need, and this is the last part we need to have a complete circuit, uh, we need to have a load, okay? Now that load consumes the electrical current or the energy and it transforms it into some kind of work, okay? And that kind of work is either in heat or motion, okay? You're thinking, okay, well, Mike, what about light bulbs? Light bulbs are actually heat that we can see. There's a visible range uh, or spectrum that you can actually see the heat. It could also be so low that we don't see the heat or too high and it gets in different ranges. But the incandescent lights that we see, for example, um, that's actually a filament heating up and glowing. So we're seeing heat. Uh, that's what we're actually seeing. We're not seeing light. The light is the uh, byproduct of the heat, you might say. So just this little technical thing there. But um, we all, the, the device, the load, is what we have to have in a circuit to resist that current flow and turn it into some kind of work. Okay. Um, in, like I said, in the uh, brew house, we're going to see uh, a resistive load. A load's going to be our heating element for our hot liquor tank, our mash tun if it has one in there, um, also our, uh, our uh, boil kettle, okay? Um, we have pumps that we transfer from the hot liquor tank to the mash tun to the boil kettle to, to the fermenters. Um, and so we use pumps. That converts the current flow into rotary motion, that rotary motion being a motor, okay, spinning around and around. Okay, and um, same thing over here with our mill. We have a, uh, an electric motor that runs our mill, and it's converting that electron flow into some form of work. In this case, it's a rotary motion that turns those, uh, th that turns the, the mill uh, and grinds the, uh, the, the rollers, excuse me, and, and it grinds and mills the grain. Uh, but it's done with electric motors that's converting that electron flow into rotary motion, okay? So that's what we do with a load, all right? Now, again, a load creates the resistance to the current trying to pass through that, okay? That's just part of, uh, of creating, of, of converting it into some form of work, okay? And it creates a resistance. It slows that current flow down because it's using it, okay? Um, if we didn't have a load, we would have a very fast current flow between the, uh, in, from leaving our power supply, or power source, excuse me, our power source back to our uh, power source. And we've got to have a complete circuit. 
So if we didn't have that load, it would move very, very quickly. And with very, very fast electron flow comes very high heat. Very high heat can melt conductors, cause fires and things like that. So we always have to have a load. Otherwise, we have a short circuit. I'm sure a lot of people have heard that. We have a short circuit, meaning that we go from our one side of our power source back to our other side of our power source with too much or too fast of electron flow. Okay, so or too much current. Okay, now in our homes, if we have too much current, we it trips a breaker and everything, and that circuit shuts down. We go to reset that breaker, and we but hopefully we try to find out, hey, why is it? Why is the current fly, uh, flowing so quickly? We got a problem. Okay, and but uh, this is what our load does for us. It converts the electron flow into mechanical energy. All right, and it, in the form of work. Uh, like I said, electric motor, and again, this is the most common, we put uh, current flow through this filament, and that filament glows because of the amount of heat that it's creating, okay, and we actually see the light, all right, so now we've got all three, we've got power source, we've got the conductor, and we've got the load, okay, so one thing about a circuit, a complete circuit, is that the electricity will leave our power source, whether it's DC or AC, okay, whether it's uh, hooked to a battery or a power supply, um, in DC, or we plug something up uh, in our, uh, you know, to an outlet or something. Regardless of that, it leaves our power source, and it's always trying to get back home. Okay, I just use that. It's the kind of thing that helps me troubleshoot a lot. You know, as I'm tracing down drawings and schematics and trying to figure out why something's not working, I know that it's going to leave a power source, and it's got to get back home. My job as a technician is to find out where's the breakdown, where 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 are we not getting back home? What's what's keeping us from getting that? back home and completing the circuit and, and performing like it should. So again, just keep it in your mind like, okay, electricity has to leave, but it always has to get back home in order to complete a circuit. And when we have that complete circuit, we call it a closed circuit. Okay, here's a little graphic for a closed circuit. Okay, and this is with AC voltage. Remember I said uh, we can have AC or DC, but we're always trying to get back home. So we're leaving, going through our load, and we're coming back home. Now, one thing you'll see these arrows change. I think you can probably see these on the video here. But they are changing direction, and they're doing so 60 times a second. Keep that in mind, okay? 60 times a second. That has to do with hertz, and we're going to talk about that a little later. But just keep that in the back of your mind. But what we do have here, regardless of the power source and regardless of the load, we have a complete circuit, okay? The current uh, is leaving our power source, and we are going through the light bulb. Everything's connected nicely and we're going back and we're completing our circuit. That's what we call a closed circuit. Now, a break in the path is what we know as an open circuit. Here on the left, the graphic is, is just fine like the one we had before. We're leaving our power source. This is a, a, a DC power source, the symbol kind of for um, a DC power source. So we're leaving our power source, going through the light, lighting up the light. The light's okay, we're not burned out. The element's not, uh, filament's not burned out. And we have a complete closed circuit. This is an open circuit, meaning that we leave, our, um, we leave our power source, we go through the light, and we come up to here, and there's a gap or a break uh, or a loose or open connection in our conductor, okay? And so it's just kind of hanging out right there. It's not getting back home. So this is not a complete circuit, so we call that an open circuit, okay? And it could be that the wire is perfectly fine if we had a burned out light bulb, okay? Uh, if the filament, as you, I know all of you have seen these at some point, uh, a filament in the light bulb burns out, that's the path of electricity through that filament and on back to the power source. If it burns out, you have an open circuit. And the open circuit is, is the result of a blown light bulb, a burned out light bulb, okay? So that's the difference between an open and closed circuit. Now, uh, an open circuit could be accidental with a break in a wire or burned out uh, element in our filament, excuse me, in the light bulb, or it could be the result of a switch being open. Okay? And going back to our household type things, okay, you go and flip a switch on, you have power coming from your breaker box uh, through your house, through the conductors are routed up through the ceiling, down the wall, okay, into a switch that you flip on and off. What you're doing is you're opening and closing the path of current that's going to the light bulb to turn on. Okay, so when you throw that light switch, next time you go to your house, okay, you never thought about this before, uh, next time you throw that switch, you are completing a, a circuit here and allowing the current flow to go through the light and on back to the breaker panel. Okay, it always, in your home, it always gets back to your breaker panel. And again, this could be, this could be a, a pump motor in our brewery. Um, it could be an element 
uh, for heating, but it's a little, uh, typically it's not in this simple circuit, it's usually a different type of circuit that we'll get into, but um, my point is, is that uh, you can open the, the circuit, have an open circuit, and do it on purpose with a switch, or close that circuit uh, when you turn the light switch on, okay? So I'm just trying to give you an idea here, like I said, uh, these are open and closed circuits one more time, uh, nothing, nothing real difficult, but you know, you got to have a path from this power source all the way back. And we sort of take the magic or the, uh, the mystery out of this when we break it down this simple with why something might not be working. It also helps you take the guesswork out of it. So that's what I've got for you so far in this video. Um, we're going to continue on with uh, lecture video number two as part of this uh, Fundamentals of Electricity uh, lesson. But for right now, I'm going to take a quick break, uh, kind of digest that, bring that, you know, kind of let it set in. Of course, you've got reading that will help supplement what I'm talking about. And if you have any questions at all, please come and get me uh, or, or call me or something, and we'll talk about it and get it all squared up. But for right now, let's take a break. Be sure to come back for uh, part two because it's going to be exciting and riveting. I can promise you that. So uh, make sure you come back. And thank you so much for watching.